Hi and welcome to State of Mind with me Dr. Sham Bhatt. This is the podcast about the new Indian mind and how we can use insights from both western psychology and eastern insights about the mind and body to lead a healthier more fulfilling life. Apologies about the delay on this episode I was traveling and uh, ironically the episode on Maya went missing <laughs> it became an illusion for a while but here we are let's continue our discussion about Maya the idea that the reality you're experiencing is not reality but an illusion is that really true what does science tell us about how your mind is experiencing reality the last episode i said that the brain does not see reality but rather it constructs the reality we are experiencing meaning that the world you're experiencing right now is not reality is not an objective reality that everyone can agree about which means that the reality you're experiencing right now is not objective it's not shared by anyone else and it doesn't exist outside your own mind your own head hard to believe isn't it we'll consider that your reality is primarily made up of perceptions that is all the sensory impressions you're getting from the environment both outside and within your body and then a layer of thoughts and feelings and reactions and responses to all the sensory impressions you're getting so let's analyze how this reality is constructed from the beginning which is the sensory impressions so let's say you're hearing my sound are you really hearing a sound does the sound exist or are you creating the sound in your head in order to understand that let me ask you to consider that old zen koan if a tree falls in a forest and there's nobody there to hear it did it make a sound well consider how sound is actually perceived when a tree falls there is obviously an impact and that impact of the tree on the ground causes vibrations in the air these vibrations are not sound they're just changes in the energy patterns of the of the air and that's what we call a wave and these waves then travel and are picked up by your ears or rather your ear receives these vibrations and then these vibrations start making the tympanic membrane or the ear uh, drum start vibrating so the vibrations in the air cause vibrations in the ear drum at this point there's still no sound there's only vibration then the vibration of the ear drum is transmitted to what we call the semicircular canal the inner ear which is full of fluid and that fluid starts to vibrate as well it's like a little ocean in your ear the waters in that ocean start vibrating in response to the vibrations in the air which is in turn caused by the impact of the tree on the ground well then the vibrations in the fluid are transmitted to little hair cells that are in the inner ear and these little hair cells are like well picture them like little seaweed algae on the floor of the ocean bed that start waving now in time to the waves of the fluid and at this point there's still no sound there's just waves now the waves of these hair cells cause a release of ions like potassium and sodium which becomes electric signals which basically becomes electricity so it's almost like a hydroelectric plant in the head it's it's remarkable so you have the hair cells vibrating now causing release of ions which is actually now an electric current this electricity is passed it's now called a nerve impulse this nerve impulse is carried into the brain into what we call the auditory cortex of the brain and different parts of the brain where finally it is perceived and labeled by the brain as sound but in actual fact there was no sound until the waves entered the brain and were converted into electrical energy which was then perceived by your brain and by all human well all mammalian brains as sound 
So the fact that you and I can agree that there's a sound only means that we have the same neurological system that is converting the waves into something that we call sound. But in actual fact, there is no sound in that forest when the tree falls onto the fl forest floor. There's only silence and there's only vibration. That's remarkable, isn't it? It's remarkable that our brain takes energy and converts it into a sensory experience. And the same is true for all the other senses. Are you really seeing something out there? Well, not really. What you're seeing is, a, is light and shadow, which is then picked up by the retina, your eyes, and then once again converted into electrical signals. And by the way, for vision, you might know this, that the actual image is upside down and then has to be reconverted by the brain to present um, the world the right, the right side up. But actually, if you didn't have this neurological apparatus, there is nothing to see. There's no object. There's only, again, uh, wavelengths. There's only light and shadow of certain frequencies, certain wavelengths. And keep in mind that our visual spectrum is very narrow. There's a lot of light and shadow that you cannot see outside our visual spectrum. The same thing is true about our sound. There's ultrasonic frequencies and um, subsonic frequencies that we cannot pick up. We're experiencing, in that sense, a very small fragment of reality. Outside the periphery of your vision, your touch, your sight, your sensations right now, is not the world as you're experiencing it. Rather, it's an amorphous, infinite mass of vibration out there. This is true. It's scientific. I'm not making this up. Now, you might say at this point, well, so what? I understand that I'm limited by my brain. I'm limited by my neurological apparatus. But it is reality for me and for perhaps all the other people living on this planet, this is reality. If I punch a wall, I am going to get hurt. So it is reality. Well, it is and it isn't. Yes, you're right in that the reality we are experiencing ultimately is real for us, in that while an organism of a different density might not perceive the wall as solid, so in that sense the solidity of the wall is not inherent in the wall, it's only solid when it interacts, when the wall interacts with the density of another being. So I want you to understand that everything around you is relative. Anything that is solid, that is fluid, it's only solid and fluid for my perception. So two main points to consider now about your world is one that it is being constructed by your brain using energy and information of different wavelengths and vibrations around you. And secondly, that the experience is only inside your head. Yes, we can agree with each other, we can talk to each other and we can feel that we have a shared reality. But the fact is that the precise way you're experiencing the world is not being shared by anybody else. Because once your brain processes all the sensory information, and creates this world, you're still not conscious of all the bits of information coming to your brain. There are hundreds of thousands of bits of information coming into the sensory system, into the brain at every second, but the brain can consciously process only about 120 bits of information per second. So the brain is actually a filter which is designed to protect us from the onslaught of overwhelming amounts of information. It's not just that our brain constructs and filters our reality. It's that if it didn't do that, we would not be able to function in this world. Your brain is trying to protect you. There is a neurological process called sensory gating which is a function of the brain where it filters out redundant and unnecessary stimuli so that you're able to focus on what is important. And remember, as far as the brain is concerned, what is most important is that you survive, that you take care of any threat, and that you procreate. 
from an evolutionary perspective that is really one of the most important things for the brain of course the human brain has evolved and as part of our survival as part of our evolutionary drive to procreate we also seek other things um like money and status and um even spiritual evolution but whatever your goals the fact is that your brain is protecting you through this neurological process of sensory gating so for example there are conditions like schizophrenia which is a severe mental illness where there's a loss of sensory gating so a person who's suffering from schizophrenia is being overwhelmed by so much stimuli that they are not able to function and we can actually measure this in in a you know through a test um and it's measured by checking the brain waves in response to closely paired auditory stimuli <laughs> let me explain so what that means is that you measure the brain wave from the part of the brain that perceives sound and you make a click right and then 500 milliseconds after that you repeat the click so there are two rapid clicks now what happens when you make two rapid clicks is that normally after the first click the brain will respond with a wave and then when the second click comes just less than 500 milliseconds after the first wave the brain does not respond as much so that wave you see will be much smaller indicating that the brain has perceived the second click as being similar to the first one therefore redundant and therefore it filters it out now for people who are suffering from schizophrenia and other illnesses the brain continues to respond Conti- you'll continue to see brain waves in response to the auditory clicks interestingly by the way cigarette smoking nicotine has been shown to increase sensory gating which is why it increases a person's ability to focus and concentrate and which is why people with mental illnesses are more likely to smoke than people without mental illnesses so you see very fundamentally the brain has been designed to filter and to keep out much of reality from your conscious mind now who decides what you consciously notice well there's actually a part of the brain deep down in what we call the subcortical regions the subconscious parts of your brain if you will and there's a particular part of the brain called the thalamus now this small part of your brain receives all the information coming in and then decides what is important to you for your survival for your well-being and transmits only that information to your conscious brain rest of it you're not aware of Now this has really important implications for our mental health and for our personality and for for really for our evolution. Imagine if there's information that you you have that you don't have access to and your world is being restricted by a part of your brain. Imagine if you could perceive more. Imagine if you could take conscious control over what your brain actually notices. Now once we perceive something consciously there is still another layer the layer of our beliefs our own reactions and responses for one person you see we never react to the same thing the same way one person loves smoking another person hates it knows that it's unhealthy and it'll kill him you find someone very attractive somebody finds that same person extremely unattractive one person likes to go out and seek the company of others and notices laughter and positivity around them another person notices sadness difficulties in the same environment now psychological treatment and therapy is really about trying to understand this last layer this belief system that creates the world we live in and so in therapy we often try to help a person get rid of subconscious beliefs and filters that are trapping them in a particular reality so consider if for example a person who has been raised in a very difficult um you know had a very difficult childhood right maybe this person's parents were stressed out themselves or absent maybe this child suffered a lot of abuse and difficulty and stress growing up and so the early impressions that are formed in their head in their mind in their brain is that the world is a difficult place 
And in order to survive in this world, I must notice when there is threat and I must defend myself against this threat. And of course, this person will develop their own ways of defending against the threat. One person may run away from threat, another person may learn to fight against the threat. Now as this child grows up and becomes an adult, unknown to them, these unconscious patterns are still operating in their mind. In fact, whatever we experience early in our life, especially when it's about survival, becomes embedded within us so that even decades later as an adult, the world is being experienced through the filters of the past. Now when this child becomes an adult and they go out into the world, they often notice threat. They are hypersensitive to rejection, to criticism, to someone dominating over them. And they will be less likely to notice overtures of friendship or kindness or acceptance. There was a really remarkable study some, I think a few years ago, where what researchers did was that they did brain scans of people who had gone through stress. And in the brain scan, they found, of course, that the regions of the brain that signal stress were hyperactive. Well, then they took that group and showed them pictures of people with neutral expressions on their face. And what they found was remarkable. They found that anyone who's been through stress and they had this part of the brain called the amygdala, which was hyperactive, when they looked at the pictures of neutral faces, they interpreted those faces as being threatening, critical or aggressive. The study proved that the brain is creating the reality that these people are inhabiting. Now unless you know this, unless you know that this reality that you're experiencing is being created by the brain and unless you can see it objectively, it's very hard to break through it. It's like that old story which um, was narrated by the late author David Foster Wallace. The two fish swimming in the water and an older fish passes them by and asks, Good morning, how's the water boys? The fish look at each other and ask, What is water? It's hard for us to see the reality that we are swimming in. To know that this reality is a construct of the brain and of the mind. And to know that in order to experience our true selves, in order to be truly free and liberated, we have to break through the shackles within our own mind. If you want to achieve your highest potential, it is within you. But you must cultivate the capacity and the courage to question, examine and change the belief systems that are limiting you. I say courage because examining and changing our reality is the hardest thing to do. Many of us feel scared because even if this life is difficult, it's still the only life I'm familiar with. And examining my own fundamental beliefs about life and changing those beliefs is almost like a part of myself has to dissolve in order to be reborn. How can you break through the Maya? How can you see through the limiting beliefs that are restricting you from greatness? Well, you cannot do that unless you have a vantage point, a place, a perspective from where you can examine your reality. If you are swimming in the ocean and this ocean has been a part of your life, then you must step out of the ocean for a while. You must be able to witness the waves. You must be able to witness the water all around you. And the best way to do that is to actually combine the skill of meditation along with some of the insights from psychotherapy. I'm going to talk more about that in my next and actually next many podcasts where we'll be exploring therapy and meditation in greater detail, but not, ju not just from a point of view of philosophy, but really to understand how we can use these insights to live a happier, more peaceful life. So have a wonderful week, and I'll see you back soon for the next State of Mind.